Welcome to the to our panel on Einstein, um, uh, the wrong woman, uh, and assessing. I don't remember the, 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 the long title, but it's 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 oh, sorry. Einstein in the in World War One, how he loved the wrong woman, suffer a fugitive soldier, and helped an assassin. Uh, the introduction is going to be by uh, done by uh, Diana Heredia, who is our two year graduate student an assistant here in the Institute. So Diana, all yours. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, well, if you haven't noticed, for those who are here in prison, there's some snacks and refreshments on the back. Uh, just remember everything's compostable. And also thank you uh, for to our online audience for joining us today. Uh, so I'll start with um, with one of our uh, discussants who's joining us online, who is uh, Tom Levinson. He is a professor of science writing at MIT who writes most about science in history. He has produced and written one feature documentary on Albert Einstein, Einstein Revealed, broadcast on PBS Nova series. And he's the author of Einstein in Berlin, which has uh, something of a connection to today's discussion. And his most recent work is Money for Nothing, a book about the first great shock market fraud and crash and its connection to the 17th century scientific revolution. Uh, in person with us uh, today is, uh, uh, Thomas Kalein, he is the Raymond F. Dixon Centennial Professor and past chair of the Department of Classics at here at UT Austin. He's a MacArthur Fellow and winner of multiple awards and grants. He's the author and editor of six books and more than 120 scholarly articles and chapters, plus hundreds of news commentaries, including his analysis of war stories, ancient to modern. And the author of, um, of the paper and um, chapter in discussion today is Alberto A. Martinez. He is an IHS fellow and professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of seven books with topics ranging from Einstein to history of math, myths and science, political news, and the trials of the Inquisition against cosmologists. He's the author of Kinematics, the Lost Origins of Einstein's Relativity, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. His most recent uh, peer-reviewed book is uh, Born Alive, Giordano Bruno, Galileo, and the Inquisition, which came out in 2018 and was published by Reaction Books. Uh, you can read more about his work at uh, martinezwritings.com. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So the structure of this is you have 10 minutes to lay it out, lay out the, uh, the argument, the, the, the reasons for you writing and all instead of the biography, then uh, Tom, you'll have 10 minutes. And then um, uh, our other speaker will have uh, 10 minutes as well, um, um, uh, Thomas Levinson. And then uh, I will have an opportunity to, to kind of uh, answer the questions or concerns of the two panelists, and then we'll open up this for discussion. So, Al. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out. And uh, um, some of you reading my chapter, and I look forward to the feedback you give me. Thank you to the Institute, to Jorge, to Diana, and to Courtney for uh, hosting all of us. Um, so that is Einstein in World War I. That's the topic of this chapter, which would be the fifth out of roughly six chapters in a novel I'm writing, uh, finishing about, uh, about Einstein. Now, uh, the world as it is has too many books about Einstein, doesn't need any more. So naturally any introduction must include some sort of an apology. Why is one actually doing this? Um, Einstein himself uh, was not interested in this sort of thing. He did not want people meddling or looking into or analyzing his personal life. Uh, he thought, and he wrote that the merely personal should not matter. If you wanna know about him, you should look at his physics and uh, you should not uh, worry or mind yourself with what he feels or what he suffers. The sort of biography you would have wanted was published already in 1982 by a guy who knew him well, Avram Pais, a physicist. It's a masterpiece of uh, history of science in as much as it encompasses the, the, the science phenomenally. 
Um, but people kept on writing, mainly because biographies such as that one excluded much of Einstein's personal life. Uh, as that happens, some of these products are more or less successful. One of them became number one New York Times bestseller in 2007 by a former editor of Time magazine, Walter Isaacson. Uh, in Einstein, His Life and Universe, uh, Isaacson uh, goes on and on about what a wonderful guy Einstein was. He had been declared person of the century by, by Isaacson's uh, magazine. Uh, but but to, to a reader such as myself, well, on the one hand, I'm dissatisfied with what Ice did because we don't quite get to see the guy behind the physics. And on the other hand, if we look at what someone like uh, Isaacson did, then again, we can't quite see the guy because other forces creep in, mainly these uh, sociocultural forces about uh, deification. How do we fit the story of Einstein into the story of the, 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 the mold of a medieval saint? And of course, Isaacson is well aware that this was happening. Part of the goal in writing his book is to tell the true story, and he doesn't want to do this deification. So this is well aware that this has been happening for decades and people fight against it. But this is a net result that I tell students in my Einstein class, in the first seven pages of that book, you find these words, tidings, halo, genius, blessed faith, testament, genius, miraculous, miracle, Glory, reverential, faith, God, cult, genius, canonized, saint, halo, genius, aura, priest, glories, guardian angel, faith, spirits, reverence. It's just in seven pages. So I can't assign that book to my students for that reason, among others. Um, uh, so Einstein didn't believe in miracles, didn't believe in saints, didn't believe in angels. Uh, 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 he doesn't think he's a genius. Einstein actually thinks he's not a genius. The word genius shows up here four times. So what happens, a normal reflex in a historian just disbelieve Einstein. Einstein is a genius. He's just very modest. That's one example of a series of disbeliefs that happen as they go about writing these biographies. So I used to assign to my students a biography by journalist Jürgen Neffe, which I thought was good because it didn't have as much this hero worship, this religious language in it. So it's not so bad in the first seven pages, but I checked, what about the first 27? The first 27, you get these words. Immortal genius, monument, God, immortal. Genius, moral authority, God, canonization, myth, idol, icon, immortal. Cult, pagan, idol, God, God's transfiguration. Creator, God, worship, saint, monumental, creation, divine creation. Prophet, crusade, clairvoyant. Genius, miracle, the ecstasy of saint, meditating trance like and on page 25 genius genius is genius 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 is genius 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 god god he was a god and he knew it jewish saint deification god of the bible father in heaven it's just unbelievable so there came a point i could no longer assign this book either so along the way, I have been thinking of writing some sort of a comedy about Einstein, some sort of a, this kind of like, uh, there, any of you ever saw the old, uh, there's this old movie called Being There, uh, based on, on a book, you know, this guy's kind of stumbling through life, and not, the guy in the movie has a learning disability, but he's treated as a genius by everyone, and I thought some sort of a model like that would be interesting for a, a book about Einstein, um, uh, but as I was writing this thing, there was so much death and tragedy, so much action, uh, so much in incredible stuff, suicide, people jumping out of windows, that this could not be a comedy. It never really needed to become something. Else. The non calling a dramedy. So the challenge is how does one write about Einstein without falling in love with him, without uh, portraying him as a hero or a saint or Harry Potter or blessed by God, so on and so forth. So I said in the preview, uh, artists use fiction to tell the truth. This is well known, novelists like to say it. Uh, they sell a lot of books with fiction. That's why most of the bookstores at the start is layers and layers of fiction, far back, irrelevant idle history is buried where nobody can, can find it. So the biographers are using fiction too. Much of the stuff that I just quoted, this stuff about Einstein, saint-like, miraculous, all that stuff is fiction too. So Einstein doesn't like it. So he's annoyed while he's alive. This has already started happening and he complained. He wrote, why popular fancy seized upon me, a scientist working on abstract things is one of those manifestations of mass psychology that are beyond me. I think it's terrible and I suffer more than anyone can imagine. 
This guy seriously thought in his bones that he did not deserve this amount of fame and that other people, such as Henri Poincaré, uh, H.A. Lawrence, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, James Clark Maxwell, Josiah Willard Gibbs, other people in history of science have done similar or, or equally impressive things as his, but they were not getting this kind of fame. In an interview in 1921, he tells a newspaper in Holland, it strikes me as unfair, even in bad taste, to select a few individuals for boundless admiration attributing superhuman powers of mind and character to them. This has been my fate and the contrast between the popular assessment of my powers and achievements and the reality is simply grotesque. So why does he think he's famous? He thinks he's famous because of a mass psychosis. Newspapers said lies about him and biographers repeated them. That's what he thinks has happened. He says historians, who end up copying biographies who study mass psychology. Can it be done? Can we write about Einstein without miracles? Uh, so one of our guest speakers today, uh, Professor Thomas Levinson at MIT has done it. So I'm, I'm glad he's here because it shows it can be done. Uh, in his book, Einstein Berlin in 2003, we begin by seeing Einstein the way that people in Berlin saw him. And I quote, a man of many defects, a savant spouting incomprehensible ideas, a man of suspect religious background, dubious reverence to the state, a guy suspicious against every kind of authority, incorrigible. Uh, Professor Levinson does not call Albert Einstein a genius once until page 229. So I'm like, look, this can be done. It has been done. And here I am in this book, I'm doing it again. So. So who's Einstein actually if not the same like fear figure? He's highly skeptical of religion, of political parties. He doesn't want to join any of them. He has a deep-seated conviction since the age of around 13 that the government is systematically lying to us. Conviction that lasts all throughout his life. Doesn't believe in medical doctors. He thinks historians are the worst chauvinists. During World War I, he discovers he can't have reasonable discussions with them a philologist as well, uh, but other men of science, international men of science, you can have a conversation with them, but not, not historians. Um, uh, but he doesn't want to make people uncomfortable. Uh, so, so he tries to get along. He tries to shut his trap as much as he can. Uh, he's discriminated, deeply discriminated, partly because he's Jewish and partly because he's a non-religious guy. At the time, non-believers, atheists, were in certain places discriminated more than Jewish people. So what's missing? Einstein himself gave the prescription. In one of his biographies, he wrote uh, a short preface. And in it, he's, you know, he thought this was one of the best biographies of him. And he said, what has been overlooked is the irrational, the inconsistent, the funny, even the insane, which mind which nature inexhaustibly operative implants in an individual seemingly for her own amusement. But these things are singled out only in the crucible of one's own mind. So this guy's telling us, look, there are inconsistent, irrational, contradictory things going on in my life, and it's not visible here. So I wanted that stuff to come out in this book. In other words, if the biographers can't include this stuff because they fell in love with the guy, then I was gonna include it in a work of fiction, even though I'm including stuff that is true. So what's the inconsistent? Well, for example, that Einstein during World War I, even though he's a pacifist, he's designing airplane wings for a military contractor. And this airplane was built in more than one version, tested in the highest uh, 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 technology uh, wind tunnel that had been created in warmongering Germany at the time when it's not just about chemical warfare, it's also about airplanes. But war is being transformed because of technologies such as submarines, airplanes, and uh, chemical gas and uh, poison gas. Einstein is somehow in that. Um, uh, so this, for example, is not mentioned, not even in one sentence in the biography of Walter Isaacs, a New York Times number one bestseller. That Einstein's friend Fritz Adler personally assassinated the president of Austria. Austria is the head of the warmongering Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Einstein's physicist, socialist buddy personally shoots and kills the president of Austria to stop the war. Um, that's not mentioned 
not even one sentence in the biography by Isaacson, that um, uh, George Nikolai pacifists escaped from a military base, hid in Elsa's apartment during this love triangle situation that I, and stole a German warplane. Again, that's just not mentioned. That Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg were brutally assassinated in the streets of Germany and that the news lied about them. Again, that's just not mentioned. So I wanted that drama. Like if you just follow this guy day by day, stick to the chronology, see what is happening. I wanted that drama to actually make it into the book. In the book by Jürgen Neffe, uh, 2007 biography, Fritz Adler shows up in two sentences. In the book by Abraham Pais, 1982, wonderful biography, Adler shows up in one sentence. Why is Fritz Adler fascinating? These guys, Einstein and Fritz, lead parallel lives. They're born in the same year. They both study physics at the same city. They take classes together. They married the same year. They both have three kids. Uh, uh, Adler gets the kind of physics job Einstein dreams of having. Adler gets offered an even better job and Adler turns it down and says they should give it to Einstein. In other words, Adler enables Einstein to have his first academic job. They become neighbors. Einstein lives directly upstairs in the building where Fritz and his wife and kids were living. Adler then helps Einstein get a job in Prague by telling him, look, you can't tell people you're irreligious. You're not gonna be hired by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You must resend your application. Say that you're Jewish. Adler precedes Einstein in socialism. You know, you know, in other words, if you wanna find a real socialist, look at Adler. You wanna find a real pacifist, look at Nikolai. What do the biographers do? They look at Einstein. So, uh, so reality is stranger than fiction. Then this physicist socialist guy, Adler takes it into his own hands. Here he is, um, uh, uh, young Fritz Adler. He goes to the Meisel und Schatten restaurant in Austria, where he knows that regularly uh, Minister President Stork has his lunch and pulls out a gun and kills the guy. It's on the front page of newspapers with drawings of how it actually happened. There he is, uh, a murder, assassination of Minister President Count Sturk. The uh, trial is an international news event. Uh, this is, again, portrayed on the cover of, of news. And in other words, this is the center of the action. In Europe, this is the center of the action. It's not nice. So I wanted a story that would acknowledge when Einstein's not at the center, we have to move away from him. This is what he looked like at the time. He had uh, pulled himself together for this uh, photo. He had been losing weight. He had all kinds of terrible digestive uh, and mysterious abdominal problems that he thought would lead to his death. Here he is with uh, Elsa, cousin whom he lived with, who behaved as his nurse and cook after he separated from, uh, from Maleva marriage, his wife. And here is Elsa's daughter. Ilse. So we get to this episode, um, the story, uh, what happens between uh, Ilse, Elsa, and uh, Nikolai. Now, Nikolai was the cardiologist of the Empress Augusta Victoria, uh, the last German Empress and Queen of Prussia by marriage to Wilhelm II. So the guy was at the top of the medical hierarchy in Germany. And he lost that job. He lost his job as professor. He lost his job at the Charité Hospital. He was demoted. He was uh, conscripted into the army. He lost his medical service for the military. He was disinherited, incarcerated, incarcerated court-martialed. So this guy, for being an outspoken critic against the war in a way that Einstein was not, this guy gets crushed at every level. At the same time, he's like this uh, womanizer pacifist one of the most just, 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 he's, he's a horn dog. This guy's just hooking up with, with women in multiple countries. Um, uh, this guy had done what Einstein was trying to do, the mother-daughter swap. And he had done it more than once. He kept a list of all the women that he had uh, sex with. This is a married man. Uh, so again, what we have is, this is not a story of saints. This is a story of, of sinners. Um, so, so what am I getting at with this interaction between Einstein and, and, and the, the armchair pacifist and the guy who actually puts his, his life in danger, Nikolai? 
which is Einstein, I'm arguing, learned from Nikolai that one of the important elements for success is you must keep your mouth shut. And later he points it out. By the early 1920s, success equals work plus play plus learn to keep your mouth shut. And uh, uh, this guy who has a way of entrancing and attracting many women gets the attention of Ilse Einstein, who at the time is a 20 year old. And once uh, Nikolai is detained in Eilenburg, she is driving over, she, she is taking the train over to see him and spend time with him. I needed these people to meet. I needed somehow to Nikolai to get out of the military base. I needed him to talk to Einstein because of this letter that she that Ilse desperately sends him. Please destroy this letter immediately after reading it. This question of Ilse or Elsa. Should Einstein marry Elsa, the mother, or Ilse? This arose. Ilse felt very uncomfortable. And uh, they, Einstein's been talking about whether they're going to have a baby or not. And uh, she asked for advice. Who does she ask? Nikolai. The next day, I found Nikolai escaped from the base and went right to their house and stayed with them. So, so to me, that whole situation was astonishing. It was like being seeing in history the kind of ridiculous situation you see in the Woody Allen movie, Hannah and Her Sisters, in which uh, Michael Caine is trying to do the, the sister-sister swap. How do I, you know, I love my sister, but I, I mean my wife, but I kind of like her sister too. How can I, can this be done? Einstein saw in that situation, again, reality stranger than fiction. How does a normal historian or biographer write about this? Walter Isaacson, this is how he shrugs off Ilse's letter. And I'm almost done. Isaacson writes, um, it is unclear what psychological game she was playing with his mind or with her own mind. Was it true? Was it half true? Was the truth relative to the observer? The letter was written by an intense and love-struck young woman to a dashing philanderer whose attention she craved. <laughs> Perhaps it was merely her fantasy or her ploy to provoke Nikolai's jealousy. But with much of nature, especially human nature, the underlying reality, if there is such a thing, may not be knowable. So the, the biographer is using old-fashioned sexism, plus psychology, skepticism, cultural relativism, the hermeneutics of suspicion, Plus the idea that reality is unknowable, plus the idea that reality itself might not exist in order to shrug off this letter. And I'm like, why don't we just keep the letter for what it is? In other words, yes, you can be skeptical of what Eel said, but you've got to have a reason. You can doubt the person's account if you have an actual evidence against what they're saying otherwise. So biologists, biographers have a habit of disbelieving sources. They don't take these anecdotes seriously. They just shrug them off. Um, and winding down, to say something about the sexist realm in which Einstein is living, because uh, originally my working title for the book was A Man Can Do What He Wants. These are words that Einstein lived by and words that can have a sexist spin to them. You know, he's trying to do what he wants but words which he meant philosophically in a, in a way that, that I can get into, but he felt he's trying to be honest. He's trying to live up to his feelings. He likes the person, he's trying to be honest. You know, he had a bunch of years to Maleva, couldn't put up with it anymore, so he had to leave her. He had a bunch of years to Elsa, now he's kind of interested in his secretary, Ilsa. Didn't work out for him. I'll say one last thing, which is uh, chronology. Um, Biographers have gotten into a habit of neglecting chronology and literally obliterating. I think they enjoy uh, not doing things in chronological sequence, beginning with the action or beginning with some, whatever happened later, beginning with the dead body. Uh, Neff's book, for example, begins with Einstein is dead on an autopsy table. His skull is being sought, out, sought open. So you learn this from writers throughout the 20th century. They love breaking chronology. My argument is we should do a relentless focus on chronological order, which is what I'm doing in this novel. You're not going to see this anywhere else. I'm doing day by day chronology. If something like working on airplane wings lasted for months, then I'm going to let the reader go through with it. I'm not going to do it in only a paragraph. If we look at what biographers are actually doing in terms of time, since Einstein relativized time in physics, and we should think about what historians are doing with time in writing, Neffe, in the first few pages of his book, 
goes from Einstein's death in 1955 to Einstein being alive in 1955 to the 1960s to 1919 when Einstein became famous, a year back to 1918, three years forward to 1922 when he gets notice of the Nobel Prize, two years back to 1920. In 1919, his mother is dying of cancer when Einstein is 40, and on page 19, Einstein is born in 1879. The next page is 1914 and then 1932. This is happening through and through in history and biography. If you don't do this, if you put it all together chronologically, my thesis is that the history changes, the flavor, the feel, the motivations, the causality becomes visible as if we were to find the, the shards of a, an urn or a vase from antiquity, and we put it back together the way it originally uh, held. So I leave it at that. I thank you all for being here and for uh, giving me a bit of extra time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've already gotten permission to take about 13 minutes, and, and I'll read a prepared text so that I won't go over that. But I, I did want to say uh, the ancient Greeks would have called Einstein not just a heros, but a tree heros. We have that, that term in the linear E text, the earliest text we have. The other thing is, if, you're, if you investigate war stories that I have for about 30 years, you find claims such as fiction is the only truth. Uh, and and uh, this is consistent with the Greek notion of truth, uh, very different from our own. The word truth is related to the word drush, druids, hard as oak. It's something that's firm, fixed, fast, and you feel that there it is. Well, the impossibility, as his writing has shown, uh, the Greeks called truth aletheis, something that is unforgettable that can't escape notice. It could be true or false in our standards. It could be a pure piece of fiction, but it's Ale face. It's there as part of the human experience. So I approached uh, Al Alberto, asked me this. Uh, I, I thought immediately of this as a true war story uh, set in World War I. Uh, and, and, and this raises the question what good is a true war story? How do we tell that it is true? What is truth in the time of war and in time of social and political unrest? And who controls the story? What hope can we have for the future since the mob wants to be ruled by psychopaths? That's a good question from Georg Nikolai to Albert Einstein in late January 1919, after the mass carnage of World War I. Nine million dead, 21 million maimed and wounded. The violent deaths of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. And when it has been established that newspapers will tell the story that those in power want told. This is not a free country. We're in a country of lies, that's a quote. When approached to comment on, Ions, on this chapter, therefore, I agreed to do so for several reasons. I value Alberto Martinez as a nearly indefatigable seeker of truth and forceful speaker of truth to power as a scholar and as a faculty colleague. The mise-en-scene or the feel of the work, beginning with a political assassination in Vienna on October 21st, 1916, as an attempt to get those in power to listen to those excluded from power resonated with me. Then there is the story centered around Einstein, a brilliant physicist who was forced by circumstances what Kurt Vonnegut's Dresden taxi driver would express as if the accident will, to engage in politics concerning war and peace. Einstein also can see the insane insanity in the act of another highly educated physicist, Friedrich Adler, whose commitment to meaningful social activism led to his shooting and murdering in public Count Karl von Sturt, the minister president of Austria. There, of course, is the eternal question of whether brilliant minds in the arts and sciences, I'm including many of ours in that category, should work as the Nobel Prize medallion in literature suggests for the benefit of all mankind. Or are we to labor to increase profits for corporations, to provide diverting entertainment for different groups of society at large, to run finishing schools for the children of elites and a few lucky homines noi? Or, as Einstein puts it on April 17, 1918, in Alberto's chapter, one of the strongest motives that drives men to arts and sciences is the need to escape from daily life, from its painful harshness and desolate dreariness to escape from the chains of one's own ever-shifting desires. That is, are we to be most of the time ostriches? In addition, there's income disparity, as we see the setting. 
relatively few super rich versus a broad mass of poor. This was a growing concern in our own country from the late 80s through the next three decades. It's no longer one, it seems. In the Reagan period, we had the savings and loan crisis. In the Clinton period, NAFTA, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, and the dot-com bubble bursting. Under Bush 43, we had the Iraq war misadventure that gave us growth of exorbitant contractor profits, including his vice president's own company. And eventually the subprime gimmickry that profited many and impoverished and ruined many, many more than many, devastating once marginal urban neighborhoods that had been slowly heading in the right direction. I know this from the Slavic village in my dear hometown of Cleveland and detailed in a comprehensive 2018 study. Today, the median annual income in this once thriving neighborhood, the median income is $26,400. The criminals who ran the subprime scam, including real estate agents and, 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 and appraisers and bank, local banks, these people should be in prison, but no, nothing has happened. There was the Obama bailouts of the super rich, some made rich by subprime practices, and his own failure to act at all like a president who held the Nobel Peace Prize. All that sordid history has led onward now to counting billionaires as we once counted millionaires and viewing a deadlocked Congress like Austro-Hungary composed of gerrymandered millionaire senators and state representatives as plain facts of life. Well, this is how it was in the heyday of the Roman Empire, when it is calculated that a total population of 50 to 60 million out of that number, one half of 1% controlled 80% of the wealth. Such wealth disparity prevailed in pre-classical Athens. The reforms of Solon in the first decade of the sixth century BC, canceling debt and instituting other measures against such crippling wealth disparity recurring it was seen as the sine qua non for Athenian democracy that Barack Obama in what his last month as president praised as the model for our democracy while he's sitting over watching this income disparity uh, grow. Such wealth disparity existed in the Austro-Hungarian empire. Notice in Alberto's fine writing how class distinction is made obvious in the Meissel and Schaden Hotel and restaurant by the floors and decor that separate the comfortable middle class from the truly rich members of high society who dine in Erstenstorf. The men dress, quote from Alberto, all in impeccable suits. While the one young woman he catches womanizing Friedrich Adler's eyes, sits with her pale, beautiful shoulder visible, lush brown hair perfectly bundled up, smiling, sipping tea and chatting, as if the world simply must be this way forever and ever, will it not be? The five shots at Adler fires do their job. Sturk lies dead, Baron Ehrenthal wounded in the foot. A perfectly logical act by Fritz Adler, the end result of having all other recourses uh, of moving Austria towards peace blocked. He proclaims in Alberto's great text, end tyranny, we want peace. And later, I'm a physicist, I know what I've done. I will not resist the rest. When Adler, beaten and subdued, is dragged outside, men in the street in a seeming act of confirming, conferring justifiable fame upon him, yell out, Fritz Adler, Fritz Adler. 22 years and eight months earlier at 9.01 p.m. on the eve of February 12, 1894, this kind of thing had its beginning. 21-year-old French anarchist, Emile Henri, who earned his baccalaureate in science from the Sorbonne in 1888, threw a dynamite bomb he had made into, a, into the crowded cafe terminus in Paris. Likewise, feeling forced to engage in this particular act of propaganda by the D, for much the same reason as Adler, but without a specific personal target. In Vienna, removing the minister president from office with extreme president prejudice might get the long stalled machinery of government unblocked and heading toward reversing or remedying, as Adler puts it, Austria's bloody crime of starting this terrible war. 
In Paris, killing and maiming comfortably smug members of the bourgeoisie might shake them out of their habitual ignorance about the economic exploitation and intolerable social conditions that made their comfortable lives possible. It also might shake downtrodden members of the working class out of their political apathy. John Merriman in his classic study, The Dynamite Club, calculated that a typical working class family of four in Paris in the 1890s, with all four members working, could bring in 760 francs per year, but required 860 francs for poor clothes, poor food, and tiny apartments without heat or running water. As Merriman puts it, the Belle Epoque was not Belle for most French men and women. Millions still lived in abject poverty. The same condition prevailed in Vienna in the 19-teens. The conspicuous contrast between uncaring rich and uncared for poor, making an indelible imprint on Adolf Hitler's soul, if we believe as we should the classic study Hitler in Vienna, 1907-1913. There is in Alberto's chapter, Vienna, Berlin, and war, the war to end all wars, except that it didn't, and from the looks of things, no war ever will. Vienna, Freud, Schoenberg, Trotsky, Hitler, Klimt, Stalin, Mahler, and later the same shadowy atmosphere of moral ambiguity and even immoral business as usual depravity permeating the pretense of central Ringstrasse, upper-class light and lightness. All this is distilled 30-some years later in the Carol Reed, Graham Greene, Orson Welles, Vienna set film, The Third Man. And when reading what Alberto wrote, I, I remembered that, and I think it's correct. One review of a fellow MacArthur fellow, Carl Sorsky's classic book, Van de Siepe, Vienna, Politics and Culture, which came out in 1980. The review had the, the heading before the deluge. Uh, in what Alberto gives us here of the late teens, the water is already coming in over the railing. A cover-up is concocted and promulgated by the powers that be that Adler's killing of von Sturck has nothing to do with the prolongation of a senseless war that was contrary to Christian belief destructive of the hopes and principles of educated Europeans and murderous on an unimaginable scale. Rather, it was, they said, that we find out in Alberto's book, a private crime of no consequence and more pointedly perpetrated by a Jew. Beyond the shocking characteristics of the war that prompted Freud to write his classic essays in March, April, 1915, thoughts on, for the times on war and death, we have added on here the strange strain of anti-Semitism, anti-non-Aryanism, and anti-immigrant feelings in general that I witnessed in my one long stay in Salzburg as a Fulbright Doss professor in 1992-93, and then at other times in shorter stays in Vienna proper. I say this is strange because Vienna was the melting pot, or at least the Eastern European uh, or at least the uh, slow cooking cultural crock pot of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And still, human beings with Eastern European and Balkan names, Slovenian, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, Bohemian, Moravian, Czech and Polish, can be viewed there as undesirable foreigners, somehow corrupting Germanic Austrian purity. Then there is the war and the timing. The war that frightened Freud so because of the involvement of his sons and the transformation wrought in normal, polite, and civilized society. The war in which pacifist Einstein tried but failed to improve the wing design, as you've already mentioned again, of, a Ger of German military planes that, as he must have known, were used to bomb civilian populations in London after the silent floating zeppelins became ineffective. And it's the war that is planned and orchestrated by Sir Douglas Haig was a daily butcher's shot. We join Alberto's story 113 days into the 141 day Battle of the Somme, 1 July to 18 November 1916. The first day saw 57,470 British casualties, one day, 19,240 dead. And Haig, the mastermind of this first day of battle, 
uh, his report now read in tranquility just seems macabre and surreal. So you talk about historical fact, but, but fiction can't make this shit up. A very successful attack this morning. All went like clockwork. The battle is going very well for us. Our troops are in wonderful spirits and, and full of confidence. And 19,000 of them are dead and 57,500 are, are, have, are been wounded. 23,000 soldiers from far off Australia lost their lives for nothing in this single extended pointless battle. I close with quotes to let those who read Alberto have some feeling and some sympathy for Freud in his concern for his son's awful talk of war, for Adler in his desperately sane act of murder in order to try to get the Austrian government working again and moving toward peace, for Dr. Georg Nikolai for hoping that a book of essays on European philosophers, including Einstein's contribution on Schopenhauer, might work as a unified moral code and create a culture that would prevent future wars. And later that a book of essays on internationalism might do the trick. We could add Secret Sassoon's non serviam declaration that he would fight no more until the British government stipulated objectives to reach and deadlines for reaching them, successful or not, after which the otherwise interminable trench warfare would be ended. Can I have one, my one slide? Here's a quote. We are lousy, thinking, ragged, unshaven, and sleepless. My tunic is rotten with other men's blood and partly spattered with a friend's brains. It is horrible, but why should the people at home not know? Well, they didn't know, and it was kept from them. And newspapers do lie. And keep the, 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 the images of flag flag shape flag great coffins off the television sets now. I want to tell you so that it might be on record that Goldie, a mate, and many others were murdered through the stupidity of those in authority. This is Australian soldier uh, J. A. Ross in a letter to his family shortly before his death on October twenty third. A fellow officer from Australia experiencing the same slaughter wrote in vain, for Christ's sake, write a book on the life of an infantryman and by doing so, you will quickly prevent these shocking tragedies. Another thing to keep in mind is good morning, good morning to General Said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are mostly dead and were cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry the Jack, as they slogged up the, to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. And that's what he And finally, in December 1917, Einstein in Alberta's chapter, his body collapsing from pain, thinking this all of us are dying. We're all rotting away from this world like an old rock that has to be scraped off. Fritz Adler is first on the chopping block. The war is more alive than us. My favorite bit of Alberto's stylish writing is this. Distinguishing between von Stirk's smugly self-satisfied upright seated posture and Fritz Adler, hairy, scruffy, standing there with head characteristically hunched a bit into his shoulders as if he has no neck. <laughs> consequence of years of cringing at politics. Those of us of our age, from the shit we read in newspapers and from politicians in our lifetimes would all be like turtles with their heads in the shell. So thank you, Alberto, for giving us vivid scenes of history that bring forgotten times alive and let, let the dead speak to each other and to us about the senseless injustices of this world and what circumstances can compel highly educated moral men to do. Not all assassins are Lee Harvey Oswald or Byron Villa Beckwiths, and even brilliant physics professors are only pawns in the game. So my point about this is that when I read this, I read this with all these thoughts in my head. And, and, and you can, if you, if you just think of what the atmosphere of war was in Austria at the time, in Berlin at the time, 
And what Adler was trying to do, it's not an insane act at all. It's an act of desperate sanity, in fact, to kill Von Schur, right? But to, when do you see that <laughs> that put forward? Uh, you know, and, and, and um, uh, I will close because you wanted to, to bring Einstein off his pedestal, right? Einstein described as Robin Hood with his memories in a trunk, passed his way an hour ago with his friend, the jealous monk. He looked so immaculately frightful as he bummed a cigarette <laughs> and went off sniffing drain pipes and reciting the alphabet. You would not think to look at him that he was famous long ago for playing the electric violin at the Desolation Road. That's a, that's a fellow Jew bringing Einstein down <laughs> to, to his symbolic. Okay. But people who write about that line of Bob Dylan, from Dylan's one of his greatest songs, Desolation Row, actually say the jealous monk is, is the religious sensibility about the world that Einstein is replacing. And they have, and they even have ways of talking about the skipping out the drain pipe as Dylan's understanding of what Einstein was doing with, 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 with terra firma and, and, and so forth. But, so thank you so, so much for what, what you've done. Um, and I also say every word that I said at the start, when, when, when Alberto first spoke up in the faculty council, I said there's maybe some hope for this institution. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Levinson. Um, I guess I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, well, that's two very difficult acts to follow. Um, uh, I guess I, I have some I have some uh, some things I'd like to say, uh, but just to pick up a little bit on 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 um, on what's just passed, it's really interesting to hear those lines from Desolation Row. I've I've uh, I've used I've actually used the song itself, playing it through the playing it through the system in talks about Einstein, uh, because the other way to uh, to to think about the Dylan piece is exactly the problem Alberto was talking about at the beginning of, of the talk, which is um, the sort of ridiculous uh, hagiography around Einstein. I mean, Dylan used Einstein in that song because Einstein is a universally recognized symbol, a symbol of genius, a symbol of you know, all the various amorphous uh, qualities that, that, that people have laid on him. Um, I notice right now there is, um, uh, I think it's a, 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 a mobile phone service ad which features, you know, an Einstein parody. I'm riding on it, you know, the, the fright wig and the bicycle, and you know, somebody he's complaining about something, and 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 some young interlocutor uh, tells him he can switch phone companies and everything will be better. Um, you know, Einstein is still. Um, you know, more than a hundred years after the events in this passage, uh, you know, if you want to say something is smart, if you want to say something is um, uh, is is uh, if you want to parody intelligence, anything like that, uh, you toss you toss a, an image of the old Einstein in and some attempt at a German accent, and then you um, and, and and then you're good to go. Uh, there are very very few figures who have that survival. I mean, I think of the cultural references I just make in my classes and how few of them from the 60s and 70s that my students will will pick up. But everybody still gets Einstein, you know, though he's he's been dead low this three quarters of a century almost. Um, so, that you know, that's one thing. And, um, uh, you know, this is outside the scope of the chapter we read for this for this workshop. But there's a really interesting story, a, a very layered story, I think about uh, why Einstein is so famous and why he is uniquely, as, as, as Alberto pointed out, you know, sort of seemingly inexplicably the one person we know as, uh, as this sort of genius of the intellect, this, 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 you know, this triumph of the intellect. By the way, thanks, Alberto, for, 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 for noticing that, that I have an, a deep aversion to the word genius. And I think the only time I use the word saint in the, in the um, uh, in 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 my book on Einstein is when Einstein himself jokes about being called a Jewish saint uh, in a conversation with uh, with um, Weizmann and Baron Rothschild. 
So, so I, I, I try to avoid uh, building that, that, that mythology. But, you know, to go to the work itself, you know, my take is, is a little less um, uh, syncretic than what you just heard. Um, I, I sort of took seriously the, the, the notion that this is a workshop on the chapter, and I wanted to, to draw out some of the things that I, I really admired in, uh, in Alberto's uh, attempt to tell the, the truth through fiction. Um, maybe, I don't know if there's going to be a Q&A, but we can talk about what some of the actual problems are in um, creating a standard of truth and then meeting it when you're trying to write a work of nonfiction, because that was a a, a constant concern, as I really thought I knew it many times what Einstein was thinking, but the fact that I could convince myself I knew that doesn't mean I could prove it in a way that that I would trust for anyone else. So that was that's a theme that we we can touch on if you all are interested in it. Um, and I think what Alberto has done is has is uh, is really important for you know allowing a uh, a construction of a plausible Einstein with references to fact and opening for the reader the opportunity to interpret that claim of Einsteinness for themselves. Um, so one of the first things I like was um, a specific aspect of the handling of the Adler story. Uh, one of the things you get there, and it's 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 one of the moments I think at which Adler, uh, at which Einstein's character comes through for me most clearly. By which I mean. Alberto's Einstein in that story is the one I think, you know, the one I thought when I was thinking I understood who he was and what he was thinking, that it most closely matches my perception. So, you know, filter this comment through that bias. Um, but Einstein has a record with uh, the way he deals with friends. Um, these are people he knew personally, he admired, he, he sometimes loved, uh, as I think he really did with Adler. Um, he is at once... Um, genuinely committed to trying to help them uh, in certain circumstances. But he's also, cynical is the word I wrote down in my notes. It's not quite the right word. Um, he is, by his own lights, brutal in his, um, in his uh, attempt to see the world as, it, as he perceives it is, rather than as you would wish. So he's, you know, um, what comes through in Alberto's reading is, is I think Einstein's uh, sense that that Adler's act is pointless, a failure, dangerous. You know, um, you read the dialogues, uh, the moments of dialogue between Einstein and Adler, and then then I, you know, the Einstein comments about the case uh, to other characters in this story, and you can see he's not persuaded. You know, yes, it's wonderful to think of this as a rational act to bring about the end of the war, except of course. Um, it's rationally motivated, but you know who on earth thought that an act of you know assassination that falls into an already again as as we just learned in this room an already well established tradition of you know anarchist violence that is that is already packaged and dismissed by the powers that exist how is Adler's act actually going to have the influence that Adler desperately wants to have? And uh, Einstein, I think, sees that in a way that Adler does not, um, and he's 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 sort of scornful almost. He verges on scornful, uh, while at the same time saying, you know, I'll testify at your trial. I'll do what I can to support. I'll write letters. Um, you know, it's not that he's abandoning Adler because he thinks Adler was a fool, but he thinks Adler was a fool, and he makes it clear. And you can see the same thing uh, in his dealing with Ehrenfest when Ehrenfest goes to succeed Einstein in Prague. Einstein has no trouble. Saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm Jewish. I'm of the Mosaic Confession, as he writes in his uh, in his application for the job. Aaron Fest is is a, his close friend, uh, you know, somebody Einstein really cared about. Tried to tried to help, um, but is is a really principled guy and won't say something that isn't true. So he won't say he won't he won't allow himself to say, oh, you know, I'm Jewish enough for the job, right? And he has to be, you know, of no confession. And Einstein again says, you know, this is this is just stupid, you know, do do what you need to do. Um, and uh, and, you know, there's a complicated relationship that Einstein has with Haber. And, I, you know, I want to move on to some other points. I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll skip over that. But Einstein at the end, you know, when, when, when after Hitler takes over and Haber's on the run from Germany, um, this is a person who has been incredibly important to Einstein, instrumental in his life in lots of different ways. 
And, you know, he's actually almost cruel to him directly in deriding Haber for, for, for having finally figured out what the, quote, blonde beast, unquote, of Germany uh, really thinks of even a converted Jew, even somebody who was so devoted to the German cause that he went and invented chemical war and chemical warfare, um, you know, chemical weapons and chemical warfare. So Einstein had this combination of being, you know, in his own mind, I think, you know, utterly uncompromisingly clear about the world. And um, and that, and if that meant, you know, telling hard truths to friends, that was OK. Uh, and and being willing at, 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 to, 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 to try and um, uh, try and, uh, and 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 help them uh, help them out. Um, the other two points, and I'll make these. I realize I went on longer than I wished in that section. Uh, let me let me go through two more points quickly. Um, but I think reading the book, and again, remember who I am. I'm somebody who spent several years of my life writing a very long book about exactly the period that Alberto is writing about. So there's lots of stuff I know. And the worst thing you can do in, in looking at somebody else's work is saying, well, that's not the book I would have written, or in this case, not the book I wrote, right? So I don't want to, I, I don't want to be that guy. But um, there are a couple things that I think um, are important to Alberto's attempt to get inside the Einstein that biographers don't really reach um, that, that maybe could use some more emphasis uh, if there's, a, a, you know, if he wants. Um, one of those is the physical conditions in which Einstein and Elsa and Ilsa and Nikolai's life plays out in Berlin in the period in this chapter, 1916 to 1919. Um, it's almost impossible in comfortable America of the 21st century, where we all get as much food as we want, where it's warm, maybe too warm, but you know we're not we're not going to freeze to death in our homes for the most part, all that kind of thing. Um, Berlin, uh, you know, the winter of 1916 to 1917 in Berlin is known still as the turnip winter. Um, it was when uh, the combination of the effects of the war itself. Uh, with the British blockade, you know, constraining the, the importation of foodstuffs into Germany and the failure of the potato har harvest that fall led to basically a catastrophic collapse in the amount of calories available to the German population, especially as preference was given to, uh, to troops at the front, if you're going to, so if you have any extra food supply at all. So uh, in early uh, 1917, you, uh, the, the Germans Institute rationing and some estimates that the caloric value of the rations during the winter time dropped to as low as a thousand calories a day, uh, which, you know, just if you're not into those kind of measures, that's not enough. Um, that's that's uh, guaranteed malnutrition. It's uh, it's worse in winter time because your caloric needs go up during, because of the cold, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Einstein was partly protected from this, uh, both because of his status and because. I, uh, Ilsa's family, Elsa's family had uh, uh, had some rural connections still and received some food packages. You know, he didn't he wasn't starving at that level, but all around him and somebody like Nikolai, who was a home front soldier and wouldn't have been getting the frontline boost in rations. These are people who were on the verge of starvation all the time. There are I've seen various estimates from the number of Germans who actually died of starvation. Um, I haven't gone far enough into them to know, you know, to to to, to feel confident in saying a number out loud. Uh, in public, but you know, it was a non-trivial amount of people, uh, and certainly the, the 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 lack of foodstuffs did things like make the flu epidemic that was to come in 19, 18, 19, uh that much more uh, more deadly for malnourished and thus thus already weakened people. Um, so Berlin was a really miserable place for most of the period that this chapter covers, um, and. Um, and that shapes things like the the, the quote we've heard, we've now heard about you know how the war is uh, more vital than we all we all are. I think some of that physical reality uh, could make the could make Einstein's character more understandable. Um, and the other thing I wanted to bring out that's also sort of this this kind of um, uh, you know how best do we understand Einstein. Um, so there, I have sort of two notes on that. One is, uh, again, we're not seeing what's, uh, what's around this, this, this passage um, in Alberto's work. So maybe this is already developed, but, but 
Einstein has an evolution as a pacifist. He's not just being pissy with Nikolai. He's been working with Nikolai since 1914. Um, and he's been working in ways that have mostly failed. You know, they've tried to do things and they didn't work. You know, they weren't, they couldn't reach the public and so forth. And it's really interesting. And, and this is something, you know, again, this really does come from, from the interpretation I came up with in my book. Um, Einstein begins as somebody who sort of takes the fact of war and great power stupidity as just a fact of life. Uh, he doesn't become a true pacifist until the 20s. Um, and his concern during the second world, uh, during the first world war is more to re to support and then recover what he sees as the essential international intellectual culture. The fact that French physicists and English physicists and German physicists, you know, speak to each other um, it, more than opposition to the horror of the war itself, however much he was aware of it. And, you know, I think um, one of the reasons uh, he may have found both Nikolai and Adler to be somewhat absurd is because at that point in his life, he their goals were legitimately not his, right? So he actually has agency here, as well as just reacting to Nikolai and reacting to Adler. And the other thing I'd say is this is, you know, uh, 1916 and early 1917, before his, his illness becomes really devastating, are periods of really important and generally unnoticed um, intellectual development in Einstein's physics. Um, and it's really easy to draw bad metaphors from physical thinking, and which is a good reason why Alberto may have avoided it. But the two biggest things he did in this period was invent cosmology as a field um, and really come to grips with something he'd been sort of nibbling around the edges of for some time, which is the possibility that there was an irreducible core of randomness uh, at the level of the quantum. And, um, you know, again, the metaphors are, are kind of obvious, uh, you know, all this about causation and, 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 you know, cosmology seen as an attempt to, you know, derive wholeness from nature. It's certainly an example of him deriving a sense of escape from material circumstances by thinking of the universe as a whole as an object of physical reasoning, which was really, I mean, it's really a huge intellectual shift that becomes uh, mature really in our lifetimes, but started there in 1917. Um, but the thing is that, you know, we have these scenes where Einstein is in his notional, in the attic, in his notional Institute of Physics. And we hear about opening letters, we hear about his sex life or would-be sex life, but we don't hear about what he's mostly doing when he's up there. And I think, you know, I miss that. That's just, you know, you guys may not. Alberto may not. It's, you know, Alberto is the artist here. And he's an artist doing something very, very important. So none of this should be taken as criticism. This is reaction. Um, and finally, um, uh, on, on Einstein's sex life itself, uh, I think Alberto's done a really wonderful job bringing to life uh, what he correctly notes are, are actual sources. Um, the one thing that I, I, this is not so much in this passage, but I hope gets developed in, in the rest of the book is Einstein is incredibly instrumental in the way he thinks about intimate relations. You know, the, my, my story of Einstein is he, he, uh, he loves humankind and has much, much more trouble with individuals. And he sees marriage at this point in his life. I think he was, um, you know, very different from the young guy who's, 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 you know, I think very much led by his hormones into a marriage that should never, he should never have pursued with Maleva. Um, but by now he knows what he wants. He wants a household managed. He wants three square meals a day. He wants the place clean. And he gives Elsa a set of, you know, ultimately he gives Elsa a set of rules. You know, she can't come into the room when the door is closed. You know, he's not to be bothered. There's a whole bunch of stuff that he just says, if you're going to be married to me, this is the way it is. Um, and he saw his sex life at that point as something quite different. Elsa, when he first had an affair with her in 19, you know, 14, 15, 12, 13, 14, uh, was a much more attractive woman than the woman he encountered you know, 10 years later, in, uh, you know, or eight or nine years later in the war, and certainly um, Einstein was, I think, no, genuinely no longer sexually terribly interested in her in 1917 or 18 when they finally got married. Um, and, uh, and by that time, he'd gotten used to the idea that, you know, 
your sex life is your sex life and your home life is your home life. And there's no requirement that the two should be embodied. The, the, the two sides of, of that existence should be embodied in the same person, um, which is wasn't a new thought then. It isn't, you know, it's 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 a. Uh, um, you know, it's it's if you if you're going to measure Einstein on the league tables of physicists' bad behavior, he's better than Schrödinger and much worse than Niels Bohr. He's not, but he's not sort of out of the usual um, run of, of of documented human affairs. And uh, I think, in some sense, the 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 pure instrumentality of of Einstein's attitude towards uh, how he wanted to arrange his personal life uh, is something that I hope the book develops. And I'll stop there. Uh, with, with just one more eye. This is really, it was a, it, it, this is a lovely and I think an important read. So I'm, I, I want to thank Alberto for asking me to take a look at it and, and, and to have the, uh, the privilege of speaking to you guys today. Thank you very much. Now, Alberto, you have, you have uh, a couple of minutes. So we can engage. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll still there. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you both. I appreciate your comments tonight. It's still there? What about now? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I appreciate the, the feedback on, uh, on these topics. Um, uh, a few things about the uh, the science, there are sections in some ways excessive I have uh, in which I do, uh, you know, go on and on about Einstein's, uh, Einstein science. Uh, but certainly in this section that you guys have, I do have to sprinkle some uh, into it. Um, uh, and, and another thing that I, that I really appreciate this, this point about uh, bringing out this painful reality of Berlin, uh, the food shortages, the lack of gas, the lack of heating, the lack of electricity sometimes. I mean, it's just an honor, it's just a collapsing city. The mobs, the protests, the, the police repressing the protests. Uh, this stuff shows up a little bit in, in some chapters and just to, to give you a flavor in the, in the same, the chapter you guys read had, a, had some sections missing in which Einstein goes to Zurich. And the main person he tries to stay with is Dr. Zanger, who has been sending him money. I um, mean, has been sending him food during the war. <laughs> and at one point I have Dr. Zanger is out because they've also been taking care of Einstein's sons. His wife has collapsed physically. So, so at one point I have Einstein alone, ill as usual, in the house of Dr. Zanker with Zanker's wife. And he's eating something she prepared for him. And then she says, Dr. Einstein, with all due respect, I hope you enjoyed the meal. But I have to tell you something seriously. It's an embarrassment that we have to feed you. Personally, I don't mind. I've been feeding your son for weeks. We've mailed food packages to you in Berlin. We've been taking care of your wife in the hospital. We've taken care of your little one too. Are you not embarrassed? Because I am. I'm embarrassed for you. So, so there, there, there is some of this, uh, this reality that, that, that Tom wants to see. It's it's certainly there, and uh, but I but I agree that it has to it has to come uh, more uh, to the forefront. For example, in these uh, sections about some of the the poignant points that uh, Tom was making, I am certainly thinking of, of this this topic of social classes mm -hmm. and uh, the disenfranchised uh, lower class people trying to make a difference and try to push forth. Uh, that's why the uh, my description of the uprisings in Berlin and the Spartacus movement seems so so sympathetic. It's just the people are sick of being crushed by rich people who are giving imperialist orders to go destroy other countries. And they say, why can't we just you know just open our stores and do things as usual? Why do we have to give everything to the war? The food, the meat, the pigs, the horses, the coal, everything has you know who are these people? And eventually. It destroys that the, the whole uh, social order, this imperialist order, collapses because eventually the, the the humans who had been exhausted of four years of warfare at the battlefront ran out of steam. They just couldn't push forward anymore. Eventually, the soldiers the soldiers stop obeying. Eventually, the, the 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 discipline of obedience that has been hammered into people since childhood is destroyed. And then Einstein, 
feels this moment of joy. This is, this is, I mean, Einstein believes that he is witnessing the full collapse of the religion of militarism. That's what he calls it. And, and it's exhilarating to him. So, um, uh, so, so, so I really appreciate you putting it in, in, in that scope of uh, just the ordeal can, of the can human I say, experience. Can I say one thing? I, it now comes clear to me. When I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have any problem and that may have come forth and maybe it's because I'm a classicist. I don't have any problem with historical fiction. It doesn't, because you're enunciating truths about the nature of society and how individual players, what, what came across to me was too, uh, I mean, the kinds of things that you point out in uh, Einstein's uh, so are the kinds of things that he set us all. You know, I, I think if you're a professor, the students somehow think that you live somehow in, 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 you know, in a vacuum and you come in every day and you're going to be totally attentive to them. They don't know that you got chlorine and acid in your eye on a Tuesday and, 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 and that the, you, know, the, 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 you had a rat infestation the, you know, a month ago or something like that. So what was interesting for me is to see all the distractions that Einstein went through. But when I was reading this chapter, and I, it wasn't until now when you were speaking, I thought of Pat Barker's great uh, Booker award-winning novel, Regeneration, about uh, uh, the psychiatrist Rivers treating Secret Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. She works off of Rivers' notes, the notes he has, uh, and how he interacted with, and he was a Freudian who was doing things not just to reclaim uh, soldiers as tools to go back and fight, which is what, what, what the psychiatrists were doing up until that point, but he was trying to recreate the whole human being, doing essentially what we would now call PTSD work with, with these people. So it was way ahead of his time. But she went through uh, his notes and then constructs this outline. She creates several fictional characters that operate alongside Sassoon and Rivers. But it's the most profound thing you'll ever want to read on, on, on the early stages of a devoted, and he had to fight against the system because all they wanted was just get that soldier back there, you know, put electrodes down their throat, give them shock therapy until they will utter the word, those that went into mutism. But Rivers didn't do that. And, but she gets that across, and it's only gotten across by writing a novel that really engages mm -hmm. people. But there's a, a huge amount of truth there that you won't find in any kind of clinical thing, or, or that non-professionals non will, will never, you know, I'm not a physicist, so, you know, uh, I, I will never access Einstein at a particular level, but, but by writing in this way, you, you get stuff across. Thank you. Thank well, you. We, we, we have only 15 minutes left. Yeah, let's open it up to yeah. comments and the other thoughts I'll say as, as in response to. Al, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, are there surviving letters uh, about uh, Einstein's personal life or were those lost because people weren't thinking? Oh, very many. There are. Scores, scores. I mean, the, 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 this chapter that you read, this is profusely based on such documents. Even tiny details about other incidents, for example, Fritz Adler doesn't want to shoot the president because there's a woman behind him. Behind the column, that happened. She wrote him a letter thanking him for not killing her. Like, you know, this, so, so this is all a uh, uh, very re realistic depiction. When I have Einstein and Adler uh, talking in prison, that didn't happen. But the content of their conversations, it's all true. It's all in letters that they've either sent to each other or to other people, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a, the guy had no idea. Had he known that everything he said would become newsprint, he would have burned it off. But he would have written less. He said he would have retreated deeper into his shell. But I'd like to build on, on Thomas Levinson's comment on, on the lack of uh, physics in this history of, of Einstein. It seems to be delivered in that. The Institute of, of, uh, of Physics in Berlin, it's, it's, it's just about him and his relationship with, with, with his secretary uh, uh, in this very instrumental transactional uh, relationship uh, on his part, um, of wanting to have a, a marriage with her. Uh, why, why is it? Why, why not to go into the, the, the contents of his physics, which is the, the main attraction of, of all his biographies? Uh, as I said, I do go into the contents of his physics a lot in other chapters. It's just in this one, for example, as Tom mentioned, Einstein comes up with a, a model of uh, 
cosmology, he imagines that the universe has masses distributed on, distributed on average uniformly, that the universe is, uh, is finite, uh, eccentric. Uh, there are, uh, so, so he said that it's not moving or expanding. Uh, so, so he publishes that thing. But again, th this is, um, uh, uh, you know, it's debatable whether, you know, Tom says this is the beginning of cosmology. You know, the, anything that's the beginning, always there'll be people. So actually it didn't begin there. It began with anyone, say Giordano Bruno has an eccentric, unbounded uh, universe with innumerably many suns and the suns are stars and the stars surrounded by planets and so on. Uh, so um, uh, it's just a matter of adding some of it, but, but certainly, as I mentioned, there are other sections of what I've written that have, that have plenty of science. But all I'm saying is uh, uh, Abraham Pice already did that very well in 1982. So much of my goal here is to create, bring to life a soap opera. It's not to chart every point of Einstein's contributions. This is done in countless many books and uh, the world doesn't need another one. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, oh, yeah I did. Yeah, just, just to be clear, um, I'm not saying that you should detail Einstein science in anything like, you know, Pais did or, uh, or, or, you know, more for a lay audience, Folzing, any of those, any of those. Um, it's just, uh, you know, um, Einstein's character is in part, not wholly, but is in part driven by his, or, or in, uh, in, entangled with his, uh, his physics. And so when you're talking about how he's, you know, what he's thinking, what he's like, what what motivates him in this period, um, you know, it seems to me there is a connection between the the increasing bleakness of his personal life and the circumstances of Berlin and his need to escape into um, a, a physical realm, a realm of physical thinking that uh, that is uh, that is removed from all that you know, merely personal, right? He's doing it, there, there's an emotional motivation as well as, you know, it's the, you know, it's what he does for his day job. Um, and that's, that's what I think is, 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 it would help the chapter, not, you know, dear God, don't, don't, you know, don't, you know, talk about, uh, you know, issues of, uh, of, you know, radiation after, after, you know, electron absorption and, and, and insights into causation that we don't need. Thank you very much. Yeah, but, yeah, but, I, but the point is well taken. I, I certainly will add more of uh, the outlines of what he's uh, working on. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of more thoughts just about what you mentioned earlier, uh, the way he sees Adler and Haber and mm -hmm. certain moments or Nikolai as fools. Um, uh, it reminded me of the way he sees uh, Adler and uh, Mileva, which is uh, when people ask Einstein, uh, you know, what is it that distinguishes you? Why are you successful? Says, well, because I'm obstinate, I'm not particularly smart, I'm not particularly good at math, but I have this stubborn obstinacy. So, so he pinpoints this obstinacy, but that is what he hates in Muleva. When Haber asked me, what is, what is it? What's the main thing that bothered you about this woman? What was the worst thing? Was it, Haber asks, was it her ugliness? <laughs> well, yeah, she is. Einstein says, she is ugly. But it was her obstinacy. He couldn't put. And the same thing when, when he just wants Fritz Adler to just you know just admit that you're crazy, and then maybe they won't kill you, and Adler won't do it. In the sources, it literally says this guy has the obstinate head of a rabbi because he's just uh, annoyed by other people's obstinacy. He wants other people to bend, but he won't. And I find that fascinating. And, and I'll add one other footnote, which is that the the story, in a way, that that I'm doing is about four or five guys who are essentially Jewish. Nikolai, Fritz Haber, uh, uh, Einstein, uh, Adler, and Paul Ehrenfest. They all come from Jewish families and they all in one way or another uh, do everything to try to blend in, to try to succeed, to try to play by the rules at some level. And then they, they get crushed uh, by the system and eventually have to kind of, some of them have to turn back to, to Jewish community to actually get the, the support that, that's increasingly taken from them. Other thoughts or comments, questions?
there was a uh, well-known series called um, the Library of Living Philosophers. And a key part of that is an intellectual biography of the person. One of those volumes is devoted to Einstein. Mm -hmm. Does he say anything about his personal life there or does he keep it intellectual, intellectual biography? Yeah, that's the, he writes two autobiographical sketches in his life. That's the first one. He writes another one that gets uh, published later. In the other one, he's a little more autobiographical. Uh, but in this one, he doesn't. He's very much trying to bury the personal stuff. And, and there he famously writes that, that, uh, that, that what matters in a man of his type is the science, the thinking, not the merely personal. Uh, so uh, it, it's funny because it reminds me of this scene in one of the Austin Powers movies in which uh, Dr. Evil says, uh, the details of my life are quite inconsequential. Is there something, is something really, uh, uh, really funny about that? And he brings up something similar like that when he's writing this celebration for Max Planck, saying, you know, this, this guy uh, is turning to science as he should for escapism from the trappings and sufferings of personal life. And uh, so, so, yeah, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to efface that. What, what something that I found striking, particularly in his relationship with women, is how instrumental of his relationship seems to be. His relationship to uh, his wife and why to divorce her, why to marry uh, either, uh, what are the names? Elsa, Elsa or Elsa. Or Elsa. It, it's just striking. Is that, is that, is that a, a picture of all these relationships or is only with? With these three women? Well, it's not the feature of all his relationship. When, when he's in love uh, with Maleva originally, he writes a letter praising her and thanking her and saying that he's so lucky to have found someone who's his equal uh, intellectually as a person. And uh, and he really loved her at that time. And, and, and he really wanted to have a a life with her in which they wouldn't just become Philistines, as he said. He said, you know, promise me that when we're living together, we're not going to be Philistines, that they're going to be working on science together. Similarly, uh, the main story of my novel is not in this section. The main story of my novel is that uh, when he's in high school, he has a girlfriend that is a member of the family that he lives with and uh, seems to be very much in love with her. But when he goes to college and meets Maleva, he dumps Marie for Maleva, and, uh, but he's still vulnerable to Marie. And that when one letter he tells Maleva, if I see Marie, I'm gonna go insane. He's clearly still affected by this woman. And years later, after he's married, Einstein falls in love with Marie again. So the main plot of my story is that Einstein is, after he's married, he's trying to get back to Marie Wintler, which is the love of his life. And that's not an instrumental thing. It's, she's just in love with her and he can't, he can't shake it off. And uh, so then later, it, it, this, this more instrumental thing that you and Tom have, have brought out, I think that develops as a kind of practical uh, existential. He has a minimalist existence, living around energy. He thinks he's dying from his illness. So of course, you know, if he can get the secretary to double time as his relationship, he does. And that is what he does later when he hires a secretary called Betty after Ilse uh, ditches the job. He hires a Betty Neumann, and then Betty becomes his uh, his lover. Go ahead, Tom. Just very quickly, I'm, yeah. This is this is what I mean about we have to read it. You know, we read into our material. You know, and 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 you have to watch that. My, you know, the thing with Marie is absolutely true, and it's really there, and it clearly is something that mattered enormously to Einstein. But you look at Einstein's whole life; he has he has these periods of infatuation, and then when he actually achieves the relationship you know, sooner or later, it becomes, you know, not this romance. The, the fact that the the other person is somebody who makes demands on on emotion and attention is is something that becomes increasingly onerous for Einstein. And, you know, I, I have no idea what an einstein Wintler relationship would have been like, but I'm cynical enough to think that even with that youthful passion, it, you know, the odds are it would have ended the same way as every other intimate you know, Einstein was not somebody who shared his emotional life very well. So that would be my view. Yeah, I'm not making predictions of lasting happiness. I'm just saying yeah. that when he's yeah. in love with her, he's just, 
you know, out of control in love with her. It's it's uh, it's just passion. It's not a, a yeah no uh, it's, it's not a practical instrumental thing. It's not something that's helping him. This is just no. a problem he has. Well, I, I just want to say one last thing. I, I, these main figures, these leading physicists and scholars. I think you did a very, very good job by concentrating on this personal side of them, of, of, of you know, essentially creating uh, models for all of us in this room or anyone who's going to read your book uh, of, you know, what it takes to take moral action uh, publicly. You know, that, that, that's, that's one of the main threads, you know, and Adler is not acting insanely. Adler is not saying, well, if I kill this guy, the war is certainly going to be over. What he's after is, is breaking the log jam, you know, that doesn't allow Parliament to meet. And then, the, you know, von Sturck is, is, has the clamps on that. Get rid of von Sturck. And then maybe then the process can start. But so he's not under any kind of starry-eyed illusions. But, but he is so committed that he feels it's worth his while. To it's worth his life. Yeah, it's worth his yeah, life. Well worth the trade. It's worth well it. worth his life to trade to trade off it. You know, and, and again, the end result for me, and I'm I'm going to revert back to Bob Dylan. You know, uh, my sense of humanity has gone down the drain. Behind every beautiful thing, there's been some kind of pain. I mean, this comes out clearly too in your in in, in your book. I mean, even with this thing of romantic infatuation. I mean, what 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 marriage that's lasted fifty years hasn't gone like a stock exchange, you know? But the, nobody tells you this, right? What, are you supposed to be in love at this, at this sense of passion all the way through? It's going to go like this and like this and like this, you know? Uh, well, at least in, in my experience. Uh, but I, I don't think that, that I'm speaking foolishly here. But, you know, it's, 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 it's these people yeah. as human actors, human actors that, that, yeah. that I think is really I'll, great. I'll say there's a moral story here. Apparently, originally, this was going to be a comedy. I didn't expect to find these characters yeah, that yeah, were morally yeah. admirable. I, you know, that kind of speech that Adler gave, gave that is nearly what he gave. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. I wrote there is a part of what he did give in mm -hmm. court uh, 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 with some slight modification. But, but, but when I found that these people had certain morally admirable characters, I wanted to bring that up in a way that the reader would feel there are people smarter than Einstein on multiple issues. I mean, again, the, the section that, that I didn't include has Einstein talking with Haber about eugenics and his second son, which as you know, Tom, this is a, a horrifying, you guys didn't even see how ugly it gets in some of the belief that, that Einstein has, but he does believe that there should be some sort of an inquisition to, to sterilize, and I'm using a euphemism, he uses a, word, a worse word, the, 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 the people who are born ill, and he's talking about his son. He writes it in a letter to Dr. Sanker. I have him instead having a discussion with, with Fritz Haber about it. But what I'm getting at is that, that, that a biography should do the role of not deluding the reader into thinking that the protagonist is the most moral, yeah, yeah. saintly person in the group. No, again and again, the, the, the people, especially the, the Maleva, Elsa, and, and several other people in, will have the moral high ground over Einstein in the story. Just because, as he says, some of what one does is irrational. He's aware of it, and he's aware that people aren't talking about it because he's he's become the saint. Well, and even in true history, does this? You got Pericles' funeral oration and Pericles' last speech. In Pericles' funeral oration, we have this starry-eyed vision of the United States as the spreader of democracy, and everybody loves us. In the last speech of Pericles, he said, "We've taken over an empire by brutal force." And you have to hold on to power and crush these people. And <laughs> otherwise, you're not going to survive. You're going to be destroyed. You know, and, and so in, in a history, you can you can have the, the, the public propaganda and, and the, the private reality put out there at, at once. So, I mean, and you seem to be able to do this in this, uh, as I say, like this great historical fiction, I, I would call this. And, and, and don't worry about the fiction and the fact elementary is. I mean, that you invent them. People had the warned me. People had warned me that in classics, they're not as focused on whether something really happened that's in history. Well, no, it's, 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 you, no, 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 one is, no. There is a professor no, in wrong. classics who used no, to no, say history is fiction. And a friend of mine got a tattoo that said that. His yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, let's not go to that extreme. But you know what I'm getting, I hope you know what I'm getting at. I yeah. mean, there, there's a, there's a, I believe there's a lack of feeling in, 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 most, in the ways the academy has, has developed. And, and there's also a lack of, um, for 
lot of the other term emotion in the contents of how we teach uh, our, our, our very yeah I, I love this line you said about uh, the truth is what is unforgettable what is permanent well and that's good so, 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 so the yeah. idea whatever the story was that became mainstream or, the, or that became influential that becomes a more powerful yeah, yeah, player yeah, in history than and, and the secret conversation of what really happened. Well, because they recognize it as, a, as applicable to how human beings act in society. That's, mm -hmm. that's the important thing, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, uh, well, yeah. to, to know that LBJ said, I'm not going to be the first president to lose a war, uh, not against a fourth rate, but raggedy ass Asian country. That, that just encapsulates it, you know. Mm -hmm. How can you, you know, he has this great society program, but he's he's conducting his actions in war for political reasons, and it has a lot to do with his own fucking ego. And, and in that statement, he just puts it right on display. And then he has Walt Matt Bomber Rostow, who knows fuck all about foreign policy, and is viewed here as a kindly uncle. This guy wanted to bomb North Vietnam, drop the A bomb. You know, and yet he was wandering around here like, oh, I, I'm like, as the United States presented Joseph Stalin to the American people when we wanted to be allied with the, the Russians against the Germans, you know, you know, so this is you know, when you think about that stuff, it's just crazy. And then you have the Vietnam summit and Henry Kissinger comes out and says the United States has effectively lost every all five wars it's fought during World War Two. And nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to say, well, we better revise our curriculum with Andrew Kissinger thinks this. We should. But, you know, kids go wandering through. Well, well it was wonderful to, keep the job, to drop. And Richard Nixon, the line to the American public. We, just, yeah, well, well, yeah, we, we, we have to end yeah. the, the conversation. is 1.33. And yeah. we appreciate all your uh, the, the audience here online. And we can carry out this conversation outside um, the uh, the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. It was great. Congratulations, Alberto. <laughs>